1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in the King James, it reads, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. If your Bible is the same as mine, I think the word gifts is in italics, and it's plural. The word, that the word, when a, when a word is in italics, basically it means that there is nothing in the original to justify that word being there. Since the word is in plural, gifts is in plural, then the word spiritual is his spiritual gifts. But it goes beyond this, and the word is this, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, if there were one verse, the way I read it, now concerning not spiritual gifts, but spirituals, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this. If there was one verse that signified, if, I, if someone asked me what one verse represents the vision or the call of Pinecrest, I think I'd have to use this verse. Concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I believe this verse would be pretty close to what we're trying to say. Now, I was in a particular situation where the, where the dean of a, of, of, of a Bible college got up and said, made a statement. It was a good statement, but the Lord brought it back to me. And, and he said this, he said, I am an educator. I am an educator. And I thought, well, that's, that's nice, it's good. You know, that, I thought that's, that's nice. But then the Lord began to speak to me and deal with me about that. And that has, statement has stuck to me like glue. And simply said that word, I'm an educator. You see, you educate what? The brain, the mind educate the head. An educator means that you're going to learn a bunch of facts, some information, you're going to learn something. And if a man is an educator and he's in a school, that's good because at least you're going to get educated. But, all three capitals, B-U-T, but, Pinecrest. Uh, well, let me say it this way. Education applies to the head. Spirituals applies to the heart. Education is learning doctrine, the facts of God, which we need. We have a head and we're supposed to use it. We're not called to be ignorant. We're not called to be dumb. We're called to use our head. We're not called to be flaky. We're called to be sensible and reasonable and logical. That's, that, that's, that's normal. When you, when you get up in the morning, you put your right shoe on your right foot. You know, you, you do the same thing every morning. You always put your right shoe on your right foot. You know, see, there's, there, there's an order to life. And we, you don't just do things haphazard. And our life should be ordered that way. There's nothing wrong with that. See, education is good. It has its place. But back in 1959, when I was caught up, up on the top floor of this building, I was literally raptured. Someone said, do you believe in the rapture? I usually say, yes, I do. A little different, but I, I do, because I, I was raptured. I believe in the rapture. I was raptured. I was caught up, literally, taken up into manifest glory. And the Lord spoke to me about training or preparing a people for the supernatural, for the spirit. Training people for the supernatural, the spirit. Now, spirituals goes beyond gifts. If, for instance, if I have a gift of healing, and, well, maybe I have a special gift of healing and, and everybody that I, I pray for, their teeth get filled. Well, you know, that's, that's nice. So everybody comes up and I pray for them and they all get their teeth all filled with gold fillings, real gold. <laughs> um, they, have, they, have, they, they have a testimony. Well, it's nice to get your, 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 your teeth filled because then you don't have to go to the dentist, you don't have to get drilled, and, and even better, you don't have to pay the dentist. Amen. See, it's all done for free. <laughs> so that's nice. And it's nice for me because then you're going to tell everybody that I pray for people and they get their, their teeth filled, and before long I'll have all kinds of open doors and people wanting me to come because they all want their teeth filled because they, none of them want to go to the dentist. Now that does really nothing for the people other than 
save them from the inconvenience of going to the dentist, and it's nice to know that the Lord can fill teeth. I mean, that's, that's a good thought. And it's nice for me, in a sense, that something is happening through me. So it saves you from some inconvenience. And what does it do for me in my spiritual life? What does it do? Answer, absolutely nothing. <laughs> it probably gives me some pride that I need to overcome. Now, I'm not against getting teeth filled. That's fine. I, I wished I could pray for all of you and you'd all get your teeth filled. I'd line you right up right now and get all your teeth filled. I really would in about two minutes if I thought it would work. Have you all right up here. Then I'd get in line and somehow figure out how to pray for myself. <laughs> see, I, I'm not against that. I'm, I'm just saying something. You see, gifts are something that's external, but we need the gifts. They're necessary. They're signs that follow. But there's something more. There's something more. Spirituals goes beyond the gifts. It isn't just the gifts. Spirituals mean, means that you've come into a relationship with the Creator. See, that it isn't just the gift, it's the giver of the gift, along with the gift. It isn't an either or. Sometimes, you know, we throw the, sometimes where there's a problem, we solve the problem by throwing the baby out with the wash water. You know, you don't, you don't do that. And so there's nothing wrong with the gifts. We don't need to throw the gifts out. We don't need to throw the supernatural out and say, well, we've got to become something. It's all in the area of becoming. We've got to develop. We've got to grow. We've got to become mature. That's the important thing. And so, we, so then we say no one's supposed to dance. Nobody's supposed to do this or that. Nobody can roll on the floor, be a holy roller, <laughs> whatever that is. I've seen people roll on the floor. I really have. I mean really roll on the floor. Right across the floor. I've seen them, I've seen them bounce across the floor too. And I mean bounce. <laughs> and there were some things missing when they got done bouncing that should have been missing. But I mean they bounced. And I mean bounced. So there's a lot of things that we need to see that we're not seeing. Now, spirituals relates to the realm of the supernatural. The operation of the spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to the visitation of God, to God manifesting himself in creativity. You see, the earth, and back in Genesis, the earth was without form and void, darkness on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. It was barren, it was desolate. And God said, let there be light. And the scripture says, and there was light, and then become separation and, and, and productivity and and all kinds of things begin to grow and creativity and life came and separation and all this began to come and fall into place because the Lord desires to take his creation beyond that which is empty, void, without form. The Lord wants to bring about something within our lives. Not just form, but he wants to bring productivity. So the gifts are to function and they are to operate. But spirituals means that through the gift, that the gift is not an end, it's a means. That through the gift, then I'm coming into a place of understanding of God. I'm not becoming proud that I can operate a gift. I'm not just operating a gift to promote myself. But then through the operation of the gifts of the Spirit, there's a working of the Lord. Now, verse 4. There are diversities of gifts but the same spirit. By diversities, and we have a list here of nine gifts, but the real list of gifts goes beyond the nine. There are gifts. You know, there's a gift of listening to somebody that's hurting. You know, listening to somebody that's hurting. That's not one of the nine gifts, but it's a tremendously important gift, and it's a gift that is probably more difficult to have than any one of the nine, of listening to somebody that's really hurting and listening in a way that healing can come into their life. Because we listen, we, we are, we're a listener, we can help them, we can, you see, a listener. There are diversities of gifts, there are many realms where we can help others, where we can relate to others, where we can administer to others. There are diversities of gifts, not just nine, because this is dealing with the realm of spirituals, with the realm of the supernatural, the operation of the Spirit of God within lives, the supernatural, God becoming creative within the life, within the life of his people, God becoming creative, hallelujah. Concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant 
After tonight, we're not going to be eating them. Amen. <laughs> okay. Now, verse 4. There are diversities of gifts. We have a list of nine, but that's not, that, that's not the total list. But the same Spirit. Now, there are differences of administrations. The word administrations can be translated <clears throat> ministries. There are differences. That is, not all of us have the same ministry. And if you emulate somebody, if you want to be a Steve Wilbur, say, you know, and, and you're not, well, if you try to, you know, become something that you're not, say, I'm going to be like this one, I'm going to be like that one, I, I'm going to, this ministry, that ministry. There are, ministries are diverse. You see, there are diversities or differences of ministries. Not everybody is called to the same ministry, to the same level of ministry, the same realm of ministry, the same authority. Some are called to minister to multitudes. Others are called to minister to one. To one. And that may be a profound ministry. There, one person may be sent to a meeting to minister to 5,000 people in that one meeting. Another person may be profoundly sent to minister to one person. And the one that was sent to the one person in eternal values may have a greater result, an eternal result, than the one that was sent to the 5,000. Did you ever think of that? Hmm, that's right. You see, now the one that's sent to 5,000 maybe feels a little better, a little more important. It takes more consecration to go to the one. But that may be the greater ministry because that one may have their life tremendously affected and transformed and changed. The 5,000 may all go home, stop at McDonald's on the way and say, that was a good meeting. <laughs> you know, what are, what are we going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning? And that's the end of the whole thing. You see. To minister to 5,000. It may accomplish something. It may, it may entertain 5,000 people and keep them out of trouble for two hours. Period. You've accomplished something. You've kept 5,000 people out of trouble for two hours. <laughs> why, did, why you held their attention, if you did. But you may get sent to one person and their life be absolutely transformed and changed. So ministry, ministry doesn't necessarily relate to a pulpit. It relates to God. It, ministry relates to God. Now in the light of this for just a moment, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. This is the secret of our Lord's ministry. It's the key to his ministry. And Isaiah, this is one of the most profound verses in all of Scripture because this is the heart and the secret of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ and relates. Now, before I read this, I'm going to say something that the Lord spoke to me concerning Pinecrest. Pinecrest is not the stew, it's the salt. Let's <laughs> see, we're not the stew, we're not the meal, we're the flavoring. In other words, the salt, salt flavors. We're never meant to be big, we're never meant to be the stew, the main thing. We're not the main dish. Pinecrest is a little place that's misunderstood, that has a lot of problems. And it really takes something, not only to come here, but it takes even more to stay here. That's right. Because the Lord's doing a work within. You see, we're meant to be salt. Salt flavors. It changes the character, the nature of something. The salt disappears into that which it flavors, and it enhances the flavor of something else. You see, a life given sacrificially. Except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and what? die. See, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. That's salt. Salt means that you are flavoring, you're giving yourself for the life of another. You're bringing life to another. That's real ministry. If you're in the other dimension, in the other realm, your ministry is such that you are becoming known, recognized, a great person, a great speaker. Did you hear so-and-so, if you want to have a good convention speaker, call so-and-so because they're really you know, they really can get everybody on the edge of their seat with their tongue hanging out. See, that's not what we're called to. We're not called to produce that. We're called to produce salt. Not the main dish. We'll never be big. We'll never be popular. We'll never be successful in that sense. We're not called to that. But we're called that your life can flavor the life of another. You go out, you can flavor. You see that. Now, the ministry, 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. The Lord God hath given. See, the word gifts are now concerning spiritual. It said gifts because at least the writer understood that. It's ministry that's given. Ministry is given. We become the vessel, the instrument, the channel. The Lord God hath given. It's a gift. Our part is receptivity, a willingness to be called, to be chosen, to be used of the Lord. The Lord God hath given me. This is Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. The heart and the key to the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. The learned are where they are because they've gone to college for four years and they've work and, and worked and written a thesis and they have applied themselves and made a, a, a two-point or whatever it was, or point two or whatever, point one average, or I don't know how that all works or something. But see, he's given it as a gift. He's given. The tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in what? In season. See, that's the salt. The word in season means that you've got the right word at the right time. A word in season to who? To him that is weary. To the weary. That is, you have the right word. The Lord's given it. It's a gift. You've got the right word at the right time for the right person. Now, that is a ministry that's poignant, that's directive, that's powerful, that's creative. Steve Wilbur mentioned one time, and I won't have this exactly right, that the government came out with a policy on how to compute price support on beets. And I think it had something like 18,000, or was it 28,000, or something like that, words in it, on how to compute price support on beets. Something like 18, was either 18 or 28,000 words. You know, I mean, you'd, you'd have to have a lawyer to try to figure out what they're saying. 28,000 words on how to compute price support on beats. But here's the whole world without form and void, darkness on the face of the deep. The whole earth without form and void. And God said, how many words? How many? Count them. Let, the, let there be what? Four words. The whole earth without form and void. And God said four words. The government wants to say something about price support on sugar beets, and they use 18,000 words. <laughs> you see, it's not in the multiplicity of words. It's in having an anointing, the power of God that's creative. Hallelujah, glory. Now, here's the salt, you see. Here's where it comes in. This is the key, and this is the secret to Pinecrest right here that we've got the right word. This is what the Lord's called us to. If we succeed at this point, we've made it. If we fail, we failed. The multiplicity of doctrine, theology, of great flowing revelation, all this that is within the realm of possibility, that we can study and learn and sit under the headship of an educator and a group of educators and become educated and learn all kinds of exegesis, terminology, Flowing, rep, you know, how to lay it out, homiletics, and all that goes with it. That's all good. It all has its place. It's all right. Nothing wrong with it. But that's not what we're called to. We're called not to be the main dish. We're called to be salt. We're called to have a word, a simple word, a word that's so simple that we're probably going to be misunderstood and rejected. Because someone says, is that all you have to say? Four words? And look at the problem. <laughs> look at this problem. And all you're saying is four words. Lord, don't you care any more than that? You must have more than that. Four words. But yet it became creative and it brought about a whole earth that was productive and full of life. Because those words were anointed. They were powerful. They were creative. See, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Now, the secret. And we stress the Pinecrest relationship, not as an end, but as a means to revelation, that we come into something, that we learn the voice of the Lord. But not only in learning the voice of the Lord, but in being obedient to the voice of the Lord. Because usually, you see, if the Lord begins to speak to me about going to China, 
China's a long way off. It's something that I'd probably like to see, and so would you. There's a curiosity, there's a certain attraction to go to China. It's distant, and I can get up here, and the Lord can move on me, and I can feel burdened for China tremendously. Burdened for China. But if the Lord, you know, and I can pray and tell the Lord that I'll go to China and feel pretty good about it. But supposing the Lord starts to talk to me that I'm to go to my roommate, see, and begin to minister to them or confess something or, or declare something to the person next door or somebody right here, you see, then I begin to cringe and say, I can't do that. They won't understand. You know, supposing they don't hear it, supposing, what if? And, and we draw back and say, I can't do that. I can't do that. Because he's a little too close to home. Because the other thing is, is far enough away that it's easy until you get there. That's why so many missionaries fail. Because they haven't faced the first principles, the first thing, the local thing. See, the thing where the Lord deals with us right where we are. I'd like to say something. There are some very serious people. They're serious. I don't say it that way. Very serious people. There are some very serious people here. There are people here that have problems. Some real problems. See? Now, there's two ways. There's two ways that we can handle that. One is we can get them out because they bother us. We can put them out because they bother us. They, they, they disturb us. So we say, put them out so things will be better, a little more comfortable. We'll get rid of the problems. See, let's put the problems out because then life will be a little easier because there's, there's no, one, no one with a problem. We'll just get rid of all the problems. And when we've gotten rid of all the problems, then we'll have a big consecration service and we'll all come up and tell the Lord that we'll go to Africa or China and minister to problems. Does that make any sense? Huh? If we can't face problems right here, see, if we want to get rid of the problems here, how are we going to face them in Africa? Am I right? I think I am. I am. Yeah, amen. I, I believe that. There are some problems right here. And the Lord's looking to see. He's looking to see. Are we praying about the person with the problem and seeking the Lord and really interested in that person and in their deliverance, their freedom? and their liberation? Are we seeking the Lord for their deliverance? Or are we just telling the Lord that we're looking for some great ministry that someday we want to minister to somebody with problems out there? And if we can't handle the problem here, we're never going to handle it out there. You see, it begins right here. It begins right here. The Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned. There's people right here with problems. I mean some real problems, some serious ones. Right here, right under our nose. The Lord put them here to find out who really is interested in ministry. And those that will begin to look to those with problems and begin to seek the Lord and begin to move in that right here are going to go a long way in the Lord. I'll guarantee you that's a principle. It'll work. That's why they're here. Remember the little parable about the wheat and the tare and the keeper of the vineyard or, or, or the garden or whatever it was came and said, Lord, we sowed good seed in the field and now there's tares that are starting to come up. Lord, what shall we do? Shall we go and shall we gather them out? Shall we pull them out? And the Lord said, no, let them be. Let them be until, until the time of the harvest. Let them be. Because the tare will will we'll have an effect upon the wheat. And the Lord will accomplish something. He'll do something. He'll do something. Now, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season. I'm learning, I'm cultivating the voice of the Lord. A word in season. To him that is weary, to whom to speak. Now, how do I get all this? A devotional life is not an end, it's a means. He, he wa here's the secret of the ministry right here he wakeneth morning by morning now this word wakeneth does not necessarily mean that there's a spiritual alarm clock 
See, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord's going to ring an alarm, set off, somebody's car is going to backfire at 4.30 right outside your window. You know, it doesn't mean something like that, and you're going to wake up. Wakeneth means that you are going to be quickened from the level of the conscious of the earth realm. You're going to be quickened into the realm of the spirit, of the supernatural. See, concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Concerning the realm of the supernatural, not education, not the educator training the mind, but the spirit being awakened to the realm and the dimension of the supernatural, being quickened and made alive. He wakeneth morning by morning, that is day by day, if we are being diligent, if we're being careful, there is a working of the Lord, hallelujah, in bringing a lifting where we at least touch in some way. If it's for two minutes, if I can make it for one minute today, maybe tomorrow I can make it for a minute and a half. I'm going to be wakened. That is, I'm going to be quickened. I'm going to become sensitive and conscious of the realm of the Spirit. The inner eye, the Apostle Paul prayed, that the eyes of our understanding might be what? Enlightened. You see, we're blind to the realm of the spirit, the supernatural. Paul prayed, the eyes of our understanding. Amen. Just for a moment, I'm going to read that because this is, this is a good verse. And I'm not finished with this in Isaiah yet. All right. Ephesians 1, 18. I'll read verse 17 so that we know that this is written to people, to, to, he's writing this to the Lord's people, not to the sinner. That the God, this is Ephesians 1, 17. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. See, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That is, that we can be brought into the realm of the spirit, of spirituals, the re of the revelation, into identity, into that which is creative. God is creative. He's creative. Everything God touches is creative. Everything the enemy touches is destructive. He takes it downhill. What God touches, he takes uphill. What the enemy touches, he takes downhill. You cannot tamper with the enemy without going downhill. You can't. You go down, down, bottomless. You go down. You keep going. It's bottomless. But you touch God and you go up. Hallelujah. Glory. You go up. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know, that you may know what is the hope of this calling. Now, the Lord God hath given, this is the gift, the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth the secret morning by morning. Morning by morning, not just to pray a few words, but that I can trust the Lord to quicken my being, to quicken me into the realm and the dimension of the Spirit, that I can be brought into a consciousness of that which is eternal. If it's for one minute, once you've touched that, taste and see, that the Lord is good. Once you've touched that, you'll never be the same. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Now, verse 5, because this costs something. You say, now this, this sounds real spiritual. It sounds nice. The Lord God hath opened mine ear because as soon as he does, he's going to give us something to do that involves the cross. It, in other words, it's going to cut a cross your sensibility, your self-respect, that which is of self-life, the respectability of self, it's going to cut across to it. He opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters. Now, I just want to say one thing here. There's a right application to this, and there's a wrong application. For instance, I gave my back to the smiters. A Jehovah's Witness person will come and knock on your door. And if you refuse what they're saying, in a very religious way, they feel that they are being persecuted for righteousness' sake, see, for the Lord, because you're refusing what they're trying to say. 
They're bringing heresy. See, and they're finding comfort in their heresy. There's a true suffering, a true humility. There's a false suffering and a false humility. You've got it. It takes sometimes it takes a knife sharper than a two-edged sword to discern between the two. But the Lord will give that discernment. He'll give it. That we're not suffering in vain, but for truth and for the word of God. Amen. He wakeneth mine ear morning by morning. Psalm 5. I think it's Psalm 5 for just a moment. I'll know in a minute. Psalm 5 and verse 3. Psalm 5 and verse 3. The fifth psalm and verse 3. My voice, see, he wakeneth mine ear morning by morning. Psalm 5 and verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. Lord, I need five dollars today. I need a friend. Lord, I need to be blessed. And Lord, you know, help me through this day and all the things that I'm going to say. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. But when I'm finished with the words, see, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee. I'm going to pray all of the things to get that I feel I want to express. And that's good. The Lord listens and he answers all those things. But there's something more. In the morning will I direct my prayer to thee and will look what? Up. Now, that look up. I will look up. That looking up has to do with the realm of the supernatural. That means David is saying this. I'm not just praying words. I'm not just talking. I'm not functioning just in the realm of the natural communing with my mind, with, with my emotions, communing with God in the level of the human. I'm talking with the understanding, with the faith that the Lord hears. But I will look up. That means I am looking to be lifted into the realm of the spirit, of the supernatural. Hallelujah. I will look up. That is, I'll be caught up. See, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. He wakeneth. He wakeneth morning by morning. These things are subtle, but the scripture is full of them. For the Lord is calling a people uniquely into this dimension and realm of the supernatural. A people that know the spirit. Experientially. Not just religion. Not just words. Not just the operation of gifts. And, and, and the effect of them, which is all glorious and good and necessary, but going beyond that, beyond that, into the realm of the supernatural. Hallelujah. You see, becoming salt, available to the Lord as salt to be poured into the, the wounds of another that will actually bring healing. It may sting, but it'll bring healing. It'll bring healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. But then I'm going to look up. There's two aspects. I'm not going to be content just with, with words, with theology, doctrine, religion. But I'm going to become a person of the Spirit and allow the Lord to move. Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for just a couple minutes. And then we're going to pray with some of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at this and then verse in Revelation to go with it. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations. Now, this diversities of operations we're interested in tonight. And that can be said this way. There are diversities or differences of anointings. Our anointing can be on one level. It can be on a higher level. You see, that's something that progressively is wrought into our life. The anointing, that is the power, the creativity of the word that we have, the vision, the relationship, the realm that we're speaking from. There are diversities of operations or of anointing, but it is the same God that worketh all in all. Now, verse 7 gives us some hope. 
the manifestation of the Spirit. Manifestation means that the Lord will work through us. Some of us in cooperation, some of us in spite of us. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to who? To every. The word man speaks of mankind and includes everyone. To every man, to prophet. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge. Knowledge is the fact. Wisdom is how to handle the fact. What to do with it once you have the fact. You see, you may know something. You can kill people with the truth. Peter cut the ear off, and the Lord put it back on. Knowledge is the fact. Wisdom is what to do with it. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, notice, it's gifts of healing. Not just gift, but gifts, because healing applies to many realms. Many realms. Not just physical, but mental. The soul, deep, deep within. There, there are many realms of healing. Healing is a ministry that is tremendously needed in our day. Not just aches and pains, but a healing of the inner life, the inner life, the wounds, deep, deep within. Gifts of healing. It's a tremendously important ministry by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these work at that one and the self-same spirit, dividing. Now when someone says that they have all twelve gifts, I, I'm not so sure. Dividing to every man severally. Severally. Dividing to every man severally as he will. So I can say, Lord, I'm available. See, he wakeneth morning by morning. Depending on the need, if I'm salt, then it's going to have the right amount of seasoning at the right time, in the right proportion, and it's going to affect that. And that, 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 that dish, that life, will be transformed and changed because of the effect of my life upon that person. Hallelujah. Dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, the gift, I mentioned this when I started. The gift is something that's external. But as we meet the Lord and we come into this dimension of the Spirit and we're changed and we're brought into this dimension and this realm of the supernatural, the gift operates, but it becomes something more than the gift. There's an impartation of the creativity of a life behind it. In Revelation, the last chapter of Revelation, for just a moment, and this is visionary of the future, but Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. Revelation 22 and verse 2. Revelation 22 and verse 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Now, this is 12 manner of fruit for the healing of the nations. Gifts become fruit when they are personalized within our life, when it isn't something that we operate for personal aggrandizement or gain or prestige or power. But when the Lord has so wrought within our life that those gifts become a burden of life, a desire to share, to become, as it were, salt, see, to flavor another, not to be the main dish, not to be the extrovert that's seen, standing out like a sore thumb, being seen, not that, but just being willing to be the flavor that goes into it. He wakeneth mine ear morning by morning. There's the word to the weary, you see. The gift becomes fruit when it's personalized within our life. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. It wasn't that Jesus just had something that he just cast out. You see, he became the gift. The gift was there. People were healed, delivered, set free. The lame walked. The blind saw. The deaf heard. 
The dead were raised through his ministry. The possessed were delivered. But it went beyond just an external action of something that I had that I could operate at the right time. It became a part of his life, so much so that he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. It was his salt going out. See, except a corn of wheat fall in the ground and die, it abideth alone. The tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, yielded her fruit every month. Every month. Our life in the realm of the spirit of the supernatural for the healing of the nations. In other words, we are going to be cast out as salt for the healing of the nations right now. This is visionary of the future, but we can appropriate this. And the gift can become, as it were, an operation of the tree of life within us. And people that touch us, that receive, that touch our life, can receive healing through us if we have that within us. I mentioned this in 1 Peter. It speaks of that as a lively stone. I've used this quite a few times. That we are to become, as it were, lively stones. Now, that word lively, if that were being where Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. If that word lively, were be, if Peter were writing that today, he would use the term radioactive. Radioactive. See, anything you touch becomes contaminated. If we have the realm of the spirit, the supernatural operating within us, then this is the vision, this is the word, that we become something in the spirit. Not educated, but we become, as Sister Barbara ministered this morning, we're all as Jacob. There's Jacob in all of us, but his nature was changed and he became Israel. And the Lord said this, that he would be a prince with God he would be Israel, a prince of God, and he would have power with God and with men. He would have power with God and with men. So the transformation of his life, there was the impartation, the operation, the working of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. Through my life, that I can hear a word in season to him that's weary, and I can go forth, and a person can touch my life and receive healing into their being. Not from what I say, but from what I am. See, it goes beyond that, that I'm becoming something in the Lord. And healing can go forth. Hallelujah. Glory. Now, what I'm saying includes the operation of the gifts. The gifts need to function and operate. But beyond the gifts that I know, the realm of the Spirit, that my being is opened. Opened. Some of us are opened to the realm of the spirit. The veil has been parted and we're open. Some of us are not open. Some of us are still being religious, sincerely religious, but we haven't gone through the parting of the veil into the realm of the spirit. We haven't looked up. We haven't been quickened. We haven't been awakened for that awakening. We've been saved, but we haven't gone through a process of a new birth that's lifted us into the dimension of the spirit experientially. And tonight we're going to pray with some of you that want to be prayed for. Not only for this, for this opening and quickening and birthing. And I'm looking and I'm believing for visitation. And I want to say this about revival. Visitation. The operation of supernatural here at Pinecrest. We're looking for that. Not because we deserve it. We don't. But because we're needy. The Lord will respond to that. He'll never respond because we deserve it, because we don't. But he will give it because we're needy. The operation of the supernatural is not just to bless us. It's not to lift up the name or the reputation of Pinecrest or to fill the place up. It's not for any of those reasons. If the Lord really moves, some of those things might happen. And I would hope that and trust that we could handle it rightly in the right attitude the Lord knows. See, the realm of the supernatural of the spirit. But we need the visitation of God, the moving of the spirit, that we can be birthed, that we can function, that we can, be, that we can taste, that we can enter into this realm. We need that. We need to be touched. We need to be lifted up. 
Otherwise, we're going out or leaving with just some religious facts, information, or hearing about it. I can't find the verse right now, but it speaks back in the Old Testament about a generation that arose that knew not the miracles, the visitation, the power of God. There arose another generation that knew not the miracles. They heard about them, but they had not seen or experienced. And we can hear about the fact that there was a visitation here in 1974, and there was, that I went through an absolutely profound, I mean a tremendous, and I'll share some more of this. And I'll be gone next Sunday night, but I'm thinking that probably I'm going to take Sunday nights, probably from now on, pretty much, when I'm here. I'll be here every Sunday night that I'm here, because the Lord is definitely speaking that to me, and I had better start and obey. So I'm going to say it out loud, because that's what the Lord is saying to me, that I'm supposed to take Sunday nights, and I've been procrastinating. I guess that's a word. So I'll be here. So we're going to start and pray with some of you. Not do too much speaking, but a lot of praying. And, and believe the Lord for a birthing into the realm of the Spirit. That will not go out having heard about it, but we're going to experience it, and quicken it, and made alive. And this is what the Lord wants, that we're going to go out with something resident of that lively stone. See, that lively stone, hallelujah, means that there's a birthing of this dimension and this realm. This lively stone means that you become a participant. You've looked up. You've not just prayed words. You've not just been religious. You've not just sung all the songs through the whole one-hour song service. And sung every song. See, we go beyond that. And we've entered in to the dimension and the realm of the supernatural and the spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to ask Sister Massey to come up and lead us in a chorus. And then some of you that want to be prayed for, for a birthing and the operation of the gifts, the spirit, the supernatural into this realm, this place. I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to pray with you. So we're going to, Sister Barbara's going to come, we're going to sing a chorus.